old boy, the handmaiden, in the mood for love, Asian cinema has been booming. Let's break down the best films of the 21st century. What's up, movie friends? Welcome back to Raiders of the Lost Podcast, the ultimate film and TV podcast. And today we're doing a very special episode of making a top 25 list of the best Asian films of the 21st century. This way we can talk about some of our favorite film directors like Wong Kar Wai, Bong Joon-ho, Park Chan-wook, as well as many others. I'm a huge fan of Asian cinema. I first got into it thanks to Bong Joon-ho when he released The Host in like 2006. It's a really great monster movie. That got me interested in South Korean films. And since then, I think that Asian cinema has had a lot more freedom and artistic integrity than many modern-day American films, although there's still plenty of great American films. But especially in South Korea, they are just on fire right now. Whether it be the mystery thriller or the horror genres, they are at the top of the peak of some of the greatest filmmaking happening today. And I just love, love, love Asian cinema. I think just international cinema in general, but South Korean cinema, I'm just so drawn to mm. Chinese, Japanese. But there's something about it where... They don't have immense studio control, which you can tell a lot of films in America and Hollywood or, or in England are produced. They have studio oversight. They have massive corporate interests, whereas you can have a lot more freedom. You can do braver things. You can just do absolutely bonkers things to characters in movies, which you still see in American cinema in Hollywood. But in South Korean cinema and specifically, like you see some dark things happening, Japanese cinema. So I, I love international cinema, and you... You got me that red pill of Asian cinema like over a decade ago. When once you, you take it. Once you take that pill, you don't, you never go back. It started with Old Boy with you. I think Old Boy may, yeah. maybe was my first South Korean cinema piece of filmmaking. Well, the thing seen. is, we grew up with the martial arts films yeah. of the 90s and 2000s, especially Jet Li films, Jackie Chan films, a bunch of those great actors. But it was really like the films that weren't martial arts based. I found more interesting as I got older with uh, these great directors. True, but man, some of our b favorite movies of all time are going to be on this list. And we're missing out a bunch of famous movies. That's because we the cutoff is 2000. It's just this century. Wong Kar Wai, some of his best movies were in the 90s, uh, but we didn't fit one in. You're going to see films top from directors like Takashi Miike. He's got a couple on here. Hayao Miyazaki has a film on here. Obviously, Edward Yang, uh, huge, huge director in China, Park Chan-wook. We're going to be talking about so many incredible films, a couple of very new films as well. So I'm getting, ex I'm excited to get into this list. Uh, would you like to start us off, James? Yeah, sure. The first film on our list of the best Asian films of the 21st century is R R R. I can't believe this came out all the way back in 2022. Yeah, it's so old. <laughs> it feels old now, but it was one of my favorite movies of the year. It revolves around the fictional versions of two Indian revolutionaries as they fight. For rev for freedom against the British and also fight for their friendship. It's just absurd action. Fight for their it's friendship. Absolutely, yeah. it's an absolute blast. It's bonkers. Great music, great dancing, great performances. But the masculinity is off the charts in this movie. We have guys fighting tigers and fighting wild animals and just superhuman strength. It's just an absolute blast. I had so much fun watching this movie. It was really impressive filmmaking too. It was really grand scale, huge, huge sets, huge casts of so many extras and these really extravagant spectacle set pieces. The CGI was really fantastic. And overall, what I love most about the film was the tone. It's funny, it's fun, it's romantic, it's super macho, uh, but it also has a lot to do with spirituality and then the legacy and the mythos of the cultures. And so I think they did a, a wonderful job. It's a huge film uh, coming out across the globe. And I was so glad what I, that we watched it because... We watched it together just on the couch in the living room, and we were having a blast. And, man, I miss close-ups of bulging muscles. We used to get it so much with the Schwarzenegger movies, Stallone movies, but, man, RRR gave me that, you know, that that hit, man. It was one hell of a time, I'll tell you that, man. It was one when hell of a time. When he's got the ropes attached to the tiger, he's just, like, flexing the tiger, and I'm like, oh, this is amazing. It's great. <laughs> Cavill who? Cav who? <laughs> I love RR. Okay, at number 24, we have another film from 2022. Big year for Asian cinema that year. We have the Oscar winner for Best Picture, Everything, Everywhere, All at Once, directed by The Daniels. This film centers upon Evelyn Wang, a Chinese-American immigrant, while audited by the IRS, discovers that she must connect with parallel universe versions of herself to prevent a powerful being from destroying the multiverse. This film was so creative, so funny, an all-around extremely entertaining time. It was so smart, really fantastic editing. And I just loved, 
we've we've been getting so much multiverse stuff lately, but this really is like the cream of the crop, like just the best multiverse movie possibly. And I thought it was just so well directed. Obviously, the Daniels won the Oscar. Michelle Yeoh, who's been around for so long, finally got her so many trophies from this performance as Evelyn. And ultimately, this movie was had a lot of heart. I was weeping at the end of it. And I was laughing throughout. And the first 30 minutes is probably the funniest 30 minutes of a movie in that entire year. It was just hysterical. And then to get things like Rakakui, it's just so absurdist humor. Rakakuni. Rakakuni. Rakakuni! Rakakuni. And it was just overall a delightful film. It was so entertaining. And some of the most outlandish, ridiculous things I've ever seen in, in a film was were in this movie. And it's the only Hollywood American produced film on this list, but obviously Daniel Kwan, as well as the cast and the story revolves around Asian culture. So that's why we're putting it on this. And it's also one of the best movies made this century. So yeah. it, it made our list for those reasons. And so much of the script is spoken in Chinese. So it definitely qualifies, in my opinion, as being an Asian film. Yes, but it is a Hollywood produced film. The only one yeah. being an A24 production. James, would you like to get take it away with the next one, which is a great genre picture? Oh, yeah. Let's get into a vampire film from South Korea. It came out in 2009 from the great Park Chan-wook. Thirst, a Catholic priest who turns into a vampire as a result of a failed medical experiment and falls in love with another character, the wife of his childhood friend, as he's trying to sort of figure out what's going on with this disease and this ailment that ha- that's happening to him. It's an incredible take on vampires. When it comes to horror, vampires, werewolves, whatever, if you have supernatural beings, the the best ones do something new to the genre. Mm -hmm. Add something to it versus the same old thing, the same cliches. This this does have some cliches, but it's interesting in terms of how he gets infected with vampirism and the kinds of powers you get from vampirism as well as the absurdity of what characters do in this movie and just taking advantage and, and really digging into the evil nature of what a vampire could really be. Of course, we have evil vampires in many movies, but yeah. sort of a demon-esque style of, of vampire in this movie is what is so alluring to it as well as... I, I just love the way Park Chan-wook filmed vampire sequences in terms of what their capabilities are, their strength, their flight, all kinds of things like that. It's very creative. It's insanely dark but and twisted, but also hysterical like many Park Chan-wook movies are. Super funny. And in one, in, we get two great archetypes. We get the reluctant vampire, and then we get the vampire who loves being a vampire. Yeah. <laughs> and it's great to have those contrasts because they're constantly butting heads. They're constantly in conflict, and they're constantly disagreeing on the idea of what a vampire should be and it's so much fun and also it has this great take where it's approached as like a virus or like a disease or an ailment uh, that's received by someone and like there's blood drinking in in this film that it's done in a way that i've never seen before it's gross and disgusting sometimes but that's really funny and can be very disturbing and there's some really messed up sequences in this film we also got to we get some supernatural elements too a little play with with uh, the ghost theme as well so there's so much to this film uh, for vampire movies it's definitely top five all time in my opinion it could be the greatest vampire film possibly it's up there and when it comes to park chan with movies yeah. the third act in the last 15 minutes are just going to punch you in the face and with a phenomenal conclusion like you would always come to suspect from any of his films so i can't recommend this one enough it was on amazon prime for the longest time yeah i still be there so i'd recommend yeah. checking that out because it is, it is really really terrific all right, next up at number 22, we have the Best Foreign Language Oscar winner from 2021, Drive My Car Out of Japan from Ryusuke Hamaguchi. Uh, so this is about a playwright who accepts a residency in a Hiroshima play uh, theater to direct a multilingual production of the play Uncle Vanya. The theater festival requires that, the, that he be chauffeured in his own car for insurance reasons. So... He's not allowed to drive himself because of uh, what's something that happens in the first act. I won't spoil anything. Um, and so he eventually bonds. He's given a young driver, this young woman, and he eventually over time starts bonding with her, and they develop a very close and personal friendship. Uh, and it's got a great cast. It's about an ensemble. What's interesting is the play that he's working on, he's ha- he's, he has cast an actor from every from a different country. Each actor's from a different country and speak a different language. And he's the whole idea of the play is that everyone speaks in their native tongue. And so the whole process of making the play is getting everyone on the same page, beat for beat, and to understand uh, the nuances and differences of language and, and dialects. And it's a very long movie. It's over three hours, but absolutely worth it. 
And the conversations between he and his, him and his driver are some of the most memorable, uh, nuanced, humanistic uh, conversations I've seen in recent memory. And overall, it's got a great amount of heart and a good tragic depth to it. And it definitely deserved the Oscar win for international film that year. Next up at number 21 on our list, on our list we have Your Name, which came out in 2016 out of Japan, directed by Makoto Shinkai. And it depicts the story of high school students Taki Tachibana and Mitsui Miyazumiya, my, oh, sorry, Maya Mitsu, who suddenly begin to swap bodies despite having never met, unleashing chaos on each other's lives. The film was inspired by the frequency of natural disasters in Japan. And this is a really beautiful, not just animated film, but coming-of-age story. This boy and this girl are, are swapping lives, basically, swapping consciousness, and they decide to eventually try to meet in person. But little do they know is they're not just swapping consciousness and swapping bodies. They're they're doing it in different times, mm. different time periods. So there's a couple of two or three years, I forget, yeah. uh, years in between when their swapping happens. And it's really profound. It's got beautiful romance. It's it's really going to get the emotions worked up by the end of the film. It's emotional, yeah. It's tragic. It's beautiful. It's, it's regardless of love story, but it's a very unique love story in romance film. But I think it's just when it comes to anime the last 10 years, it's really special. We did it in our best anime films mm-hmm. of all time episode. It's top 10, I think, for, for sure. For Be- us. Beautiful animation. Yeah. And I, something I really take away is the lighting of the film, especially the, the skies and, and the, the atmospheres they created. Um, and I really like the blending of not just the body swap, but the time swap as well. I thought that made it really smart. And it creates a great amount of stakes because you learn that the girl's village is, has, is in, uh, what is it, like uh, something's impending, like a, yeah, it's about an to asteroid? Be an, a disaster. A disaster of some kind. So he's trying to figure out how he can prevent that from happening. So it's got a lot of stakes and a lot of conflict to it. But then um, the wishing that, like, oh, I hope they can actually connect in the real world when they're not swapping bodies. Like, how can they, hopefully they can find each other one day. Um, so there's so many, so many great stakes to the film. And on top of that, it's really stunning and beautiful and tender and touching. So I really loved your name. It's a great film. All right, next up at number 20, we have, from out of South Korea, A Bittersweet Life, which came out in 2005, directed by Kim Ji-woon. He's made a bunch of great South Korean films in the last 20 years. This stars Lee, Byung, Lee Byung-hun as Sun Woo, a hitman who becomes targeted by his boss after he spares the latter's cheating mistress. So... He, so um, Sun Woo is like this badass, like basically Liam Neeson and Taken kind of guy. He can he just is great in a fight, great with his gun, and ultimate baddie. And then he's hired by his, his boss. He's told by his boss to kill the boss's mistress because she's cheating on him. And he grows some semblance of a heart. And because he, he finds her so beautiful and like love at first sight kind of thing, he decides to spare her and tells her like, run away, don't ever come back to the city. However, to no surprise... His boss finds out pretty quickly, and then it ensues. It, what the, the story that ensues is just him trying to outrun the mob and also trying to take out as many as he can to survive. And it's a fantastic action movie, amazing martial arts, um, some really fantastic battle sequences, and an unbelievably stunning conclusion. Uh, great finale set sequence, and I really adored this film. It's super brutal and like hard hitting action. And it, it blends that with the great South Korean dark humor, which is just like one of, one of a kind. Next up at number 19, we have Train to Busan nice. out of South Korea, 2016, directed by Yeon Sang-ho. A man and his estranged daughter and other passengers become trapped on a speeding train do- during a zombie outbreak in South Korea. You're doing great at reading. <laughs> Am I? Yeah. Are you being sarcastic? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> You're like that kid in class who like reads one syllable at a time. <laughs> you were messing up too. <laughs> I'm doing my best. <laughs> Anyways, I feel like we were pretty late to this movie. It came out in 2016. We yeah. didn't see it for the first time until was it two years ago maybe when we did our episode? Yeah. When did we do our episode on Train to Busan? We did it last year. Was it last year? Or, or maybe two years no, ago. Yeah, we were very late to the game. We did it in 2022. On Busan. But I, I think a lot of people were late to this movie because I feel like it's just had a massive resurgence or, or popularity mm-hmm. in streaming life, you know? came out in 2016. I didn't see it in theaters, but I saw it, obviously, in 2022. I've seen it twice, and I think it's terrific. It's just an awesome zombie movie, and it deserved to, an episode, and I think a lot of people really enjoyed that one because this movie's epic. You know, it does new things with zombies, I love the the style of filmmaking of, of just putting a bunch of zombies on a high speed train 
and what you can do with that, the creativity involved in terms of all these characters in such a compact setting and location dealing with the zombie outbreak. It's almost a perfect movie. We talked about what didn't make it a perfect movie in our episode, so go check that out, but it's a near-perfect horror movie. Yeah, It's one of the best zombie movies of the century for sure. I think it's top five for me because it's that, it's that damn good. And great characters, lots of redemption. Family's a strong theme in the film. Fatherhood as well as just doing the right thing and, and just being a good person. That That's a strong theme in the film as well. And I love the style of the zombies in terms of how quick they turn, their bodies, their body movements, contortion, speed, as well as the the new kind of thing that the the filmmakers did with the zombies in terms of when it's dark, they can't really see, and they, they're oh, yeah. almost in a, in a sleep-like state, mm -hmm. which is really interesting. I like that a lot. Um, so, so smart. Yeah, I thought that was really smart because movies that do something new with a, with a supernatural being or mm -hmm. creature or monster, that really gets my attention. It really hooks me into a film. Gets the, the blood flowing. Gets that blood flowing, you know what I mean? <laughs> so I really enjoyed that part of this film, and I, I just really enjoyed the hell out of Train to Busan. And it's got some of the most shocking moments in zombie movies, and it's not just kills, but it's the reveals, of, like, especially in that train station when they're all going down the escalator, and they realize the people below them are zombies, yeah. and then they have to run up. Oh, my God. And there's a couple other great moments where it's these huge sequences, and it's so much fun and scary and brutal. Uh, but a great, great zombie movie. Great action, great yeah. stunt work as well. I mean, the the stunt actors and actors in this movie, they put themselves in crazy positions. Great point, yeah. They're great body contortionists too, especially that first zombie reveal. She was great. Yeah, when she turns on the train, the, the mm -hmm. original train zombie. Yeah. It's, pr it's pretty awesome. Next up at number 18, we have a film from this year, Perfect Days Out of Japan from director Wim Wenders. Uh, I just saw this film last night. And it was absolutely floored by it. it it's about Hirayam, Hirayama, who works as a public toy, toilet cleaner in Tokyo. He repeats his structured, ritualized life every day starting at dawn. He dedicates his free time to his passion for music, which he listens to in his van to and from work, and to his books, which he reads every night before going to sleep. His dreams are shown in flickery, impressionist sequence, sequences at the end of each day. So this film is about... The trivialities of life, it's about the little things in life, it's about routine and trying to find peace with that. Uh, and being a public toilet cleaner, no one's very kind to him. He People people don't even notice him, people don't speak to him. Uh, he tries his best to uh, find the joy in everyday moments of life. And when he's having a bad moment, he looks towards nature, whether it be a tree billowing in the wind or the reflection of the sun on a wall. And there's all these little great moments where... He uses the sights in connection to nature to help calm himself whenever he's in a, in a bad situation. And ultimately, he's always just trying to do the right thing and live at peace in his life. And, you know, our lives are defined by routine. It's making breakfast, getting up, getting changed, doing laundry, running errands, you know. Trader Joe's. Trader Joe's. These are bun uh, mundane, boring things, and uh, they can be a time suck sometimes. But if you can learn to enjoy them, and that's what I got, took away from this, this character in this film, when you, if you can learn to enjoy those little things, those routine, banal aspects of life, then you are on your way to finding like a good, peaceful uh, perspective on everything. So it it, it definitely ties to um, accepting uh, the non-exciting parts of life. And it's also got a great amount of heart uh, and a good amount of tragedy too. Uh, I cried multiple times. More tears of happiness and joy. Your eyes are still puffy. <laughs> yeah, they are. Uh, rather than tears of sadness, just because I found it so overwhelmingly beautiful with its simplicity and a portrait of a human being and also a trash, a, a, a bathroom cleaner. It's, there's millions of them in the world. And these people, we don't see them. We don't interact with them, but they're vital to our lives. And um, it's, it's nice to see that story put on screen. Let's move on to number 17 on our list. We have... One of the greatest action films in the history of cinema. I'm not kidding. The Raid Redemption came out in 2011 out of Indonesia, directed by Gareth Evans. The film follows an Indonesian National Police tactical squad that is deployed to a raid a ruthless drug lord's apartment block in the slums of Jakarta, only to be encircled by the criminals forcing them to fight their way through the, compl through the complex. Is that better, Anthony? I didn't yeah. pause every word. <laughs> you did a wonderful job. Is that better for you? I had a great time listening to that. Did you? I actually wanted you to keep reading the whole synopsis. That's I'm all we got. That's all we got. You could have kept going. I could have kept going. 
The Raid Redemption <laughs> is absurdly good. I remember the first time I saw this, it was recommend, recommended by you. You're like, I just saw this movie in theaters. You have to go see it. <laughs> I saw it at Landmark in Waltham. Yeah, I saw it somewhere, I think the same place. But it absolutely floored me the first time I saw it. I've seen it like seven times. Mm-hmm. I freaking love this it's movie. It's still man. kind of unknown. I wouldn't say it's unknown. No, remember we did the watch party and, and <clears throat> more than half the Discorders hadn't even seen it or heard okay, of it. Okay, that's actually a good point. It's and kind of we unknown. Showed, we showed a bunch of people for them it, for the first time. Yeah. The Raid has absolutely incredible action, phenomenal stunt work on a budget of under $3 million. I think the budget was American U.S. dollars. Yeah. But the, the amount of work that this production put into making this film is absurd. They, they just work their asses off. And obviously... You can get a lot more for your dollar yeah. in other countries, like in Indonesia, clearly. You can make an awesome action movie for a million dollars, but it doesn't take away from the incredible work from these stunt people. Some of the best stunts in fight sequences you'll ever see. Yeah, the martial hand-to-hand arts. Com- combat, the martial arts, the gunfighting. It's phenomenal. The effects are solid, too. Yeah. There aren't a ton. It's mostly just bullets and Some you know CGI muscle blood. flashes and yeah. stuff like that. So that's stuff that's pretty cheap and pretty easy to do. Aside from that, so much of it's done in camera, as well as the, the creativity of the camera in terms of going through walls, going outside windows with mm-hmm. characters, going down holes in the floor and ceilings and the roofs. It's so goddamn good, and the story's pretty solid. Mm-hmm. The story's about this cop whose brother is part of this massive drug uh, drug pit king lord's <laughs> <laughs> syndicate. I saw you smirk for a second before you said it. So this drug pin king lord who's just ruining the, the town and the neighborhood ruining lives the at the town. top of this building. He's very much like Dread. Dread, is. Dread copied it. And um, <laughs> they have to fight their way to the top, but little do they know that it's all involved with co- corrupt police officers as well. Yeah. And no one knows they're there, and they're getting taken out one by one because all of the inhabitants of the apartment complex depend on the drug pin king lord. And <laughs> he's, if they want to stay, they got to help kill all these cops. And it's awesome. It's so goddamn good, man. Some of the best fight scenes ever. I would put, ever. Yeah, I think this is one of the greatest martial arts film of all time, and it's also one of the greatest action films of all time. And just like how John Wick influenced the action genre, this influenced the action genre before that came out. So for for John Wick came out in 2016, something like that, 2014. 14. Before that, it had made a huge impact in action. The Raid Redemption, like Hollywood, took note, and you saw a bunch of movies do what The Raid did tried to do what the Raid did. And it was just absolutely phenomenal. For any fans of martial arts, if you haven't seen this movie, add it to your watch list. And overall, even if you're not a huge fan of action or martial arts, it's just a great film. Really well done. I've shown it to people in the past that don't like action movies. Or not that they don't like them. They never have really gotten into them. Yeah. And I showed it to someone once because that's one of the best movies I've ever seen in my life. Still good. Not surprised, man. Not surprised surprised. at all. It happens usually when I show them (laughs) cool movies. (laughs) Next, that's uh, happened with Goodfellas like three times. Yeah, I've shown yep. it to people for the first time in their lives. Like that was one of the best movies ever. I'm waiting to show it to someone for their first time. Oh my god! Very soon. That's pretty cool. Very soon. All right. Next up at number sixteen, we have a film from 2023. I mean 2022. Past Lives from director Celine Song. This is a South Korean and American production. From A24, it follows two childhood friends over the course of 24 years while they contemplate the nature of their relationship as they grow apart, living different lives. The plot is semi-autobiographical and inspired by real events from Song's life. Uh, This was the most heartfelt, endearing, and touching film of the year of 2023. Um, It's absolutely uh, phenomenal, beautiful, stunning, very intimate, uh, very personal I love the screenplay, and I love the cast. It's a very simple story. Um, but we've all, I mean, if you've been in a long-distance relationship, it's not easy. Um, and But it can be joyful, but it also is, it, it's risky. And unfortunately, uh, it doesn't work out for the two at first. And then after moving to America, she finds uh, she finds a new love. Um, but still, that, that past life is there. That past love is there. And it's still, it's not like it's gone. It's not like just because she married... Uh, uh, an American doesn't mean that uh, the first love of her life is erased from her heart, and so there's a lot, it's a lot of depth to that, and it's a lot of complexity to uh, the relationship. And I, I just love the trio. It's a very interesting uh, uh, situation that bar scene that she opens with and then goes back to in the third act. Uh, really fantastic uh, s- screenwriting, fantastic directing, and beautifully shot on film. Uh, beautiful New York film. Uh, overall, by far one of the best films of 2023. We did an episode on it. Yeah, it was great when it came out. And it's phenomenal. I love past lives. Top three of the year for me. 
Moving on to number 15, we have an all-timer here. Oh, yeah. We have Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, came out in 2000 from Taiwan, China, from director Ang Lee, the winner of four Academy Awards, including Best Cinematography, Best Original Score, Best Art Direction and Set Direction, and Best Foreign Language Film. It was also nominated for Best Picture. Was it? Or no? Yeah. Yeah, it was also nominated for Best Picture. Can you be nominated for Best Picture? Oh, yeah, you can. Yeah. Nominated for Best Picture. Yeah. It was nominated for pretty much everything at yeah, the Academy much, Awards. Yeah. It was one of the biggest movies that year. And I think it's still one of the best-looking movies ever. It, it's a really terrific cinematography. I still always go back to that incredible split die after shot on top of the on top of the mountain with the, oh, yeah. the ridge in the background. And the yellow, the, the leaves. The, the, the cinematography yeah. is stunning. The colors, the nature, blending that in with characters mm-hmm. as well as sort of that kung fu style, martial arts style in films where characters have otherworldly powers, you know, mm-hmm. dancing on trees, fighting on top of trees and leaves. It's like the stories of myths. Yeah. But we're watching them in, in, in this film. And it's in during the Qing Dynasty in China, character Li Mu Bai is a renowned Wudang swordsman and his friend Yu Shu Lian, a female warrior, heads a private security company. Shu Lian and Mu Bai have had have long had feelings for each other, but because Xu Lian had been engaged to Mubai's close friend, Meng Shizhou, before his death, Xu Lian and Mubai feel bound by loyalty to Meng Shizhou and have not revealed their feelings to each other. Daring reading all that, all those names. Did a pretty good job. Yeah, pretty good blind pretty reading. Pretty good for an American. <laughs> not bad pretty blind good reading. for an American. <laughs> um, yeah, Chad Young Fat and Michelle Yeoh have amazing chemistry yeah, in this. Yeah, they're absolutely they're sensational fantastic. in this movie. Yeah, and it's the, great seeing those veterans. Great together. action, great stunts like yeah. usual, and I freaking love it. And, you know, Chad Young Fat was a huge action star. Yeah. It still is, but I mean... Bulletproof mug, blo- not, yeah, bro. Yeah, 90s and 2000s. He was massive. Uh, the killing, he was in so many cool action movies mm-hmm. in the 90s and early 2000s, and... You know, I, I think I forgot who's in Bulletproof Monk. Is that Sean William Sean Scott? William Scott yeah. <laughs> oh my God, Stifler! Nineteen ninety eight, bro. <laughs> no, it was two thousands. Two thousand. Post American. Post American Pie. Yeah, yeah, yeah Post American Pie. Um, I forgot Stifler was in that. <laughs> he had a he had a huge he was in a lot of things. He was in a lot of stuff. He was in a lot of things. Uh, Bulletproof Monk, I thought was cool as hell. I remember seeing that with Dan. It was when we were ten. Yeah, that's what I just yeah. said. I remember being cool as hell. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we saw it when we were fucking 11 years old. We saw a lot of Perfect lot of age. Perfect age for Bulletproof They made Monk. it for us. But I remember seeing it. it with Dad. You know, yeah. that was a... Uh, Aw. Did go we to go movie. to Applebee's after, or was it uh, Chili's? We never went to Applebee's. We went to Chili's a lot. Chili's, yeah. Macaroni yeah. Grill. We went to Chili's a ton. Fajitas, bro. Or I saw the food court at the mall in Burlington Mall. Uh, also, App, uh, TGI Fridays. If we went Why to did Wo- we go to TGI at the Fridays? Woburn. There was a TGI Fridays by the Woburn Theater. We went once, maybe. We once, went a bunch. maybe. We TGI went a Fridays bunch. was not a spot we would go to. Chili's was a spot, Yeah, though. Chili's I'll give you. Yeah. Chili's, Chili's bro. Yeah. Chili's, baby, baby back, back ribs. ribs. Chili cheese, baby back ribs. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> TGI Fridays. Don't listen to Anthony. I think we've been to TGI Fridays twice. I doubt. Twice. No. That's, we lived at Max. TGI Fridays. We did not live at TGI Fridays. <laughs> what are you talking about? We never went to TGI Fridays. You had a TGI Fridays shirt when you were a kid. <laughs> What's the deal with TGI Fridays, Anthony? <laughs> You're making me do my Seinfeld voice. <laughs> when the, when Anthony says something absurdly false, I, I pull out the Seinfeld voice. We never went to TGI Fridays. You had a TGI Fridays hat. No way. <laughs> I remember we went to cheesy TGI Fridays once. I was like, no, okay, not that impressed. Not that <laughs> you impressed. gave it a bad Yelp review before yeah. Yelp was around. <laughs> I gave it a bad letterbox review. One out of five. It's trying too hard. <laughs> trying too hard. All right, moving on to number 14 on our list. Burning, which came out in 2018 from South Korea from Lee Chang Dong. This plot depicts a young delivery man, Jong Su, who runs into his childhood friend, Hai Mi, they soon meet an enigmatic young man named Ben, played by Steven Yun, who Jong Su becomes suspicious of, and he begins to believe Jaime is in danger. This movie is one of the most underrated movies I've seen in recent memory. It's unbelievable. And it's all about tone, and it's all about mystery. This is one of the great mystery movies of the modern era. Because, so this guy meets his old friend, and they start sleeping together, and it's going well. But then she... she introduces him to this other guy that she's friends with. And it's played by Steven Yeun, and it's his best performance I've ever seen. He's unbelievable. He makes the movie. There's something so off about him, and it's the way Steven plays him, the tone of it. He's got this, like, sinister, enigmatic, kind of, like, lack of empathy kind of 
performance, and you're like, is this guy like a serial killer? And is she in danger? And these, there's all these little weird hints sprinkled throughout conversation, dialogue, the way he behaves, his, his body posture. It really is like an Oscar nomination worthy performance. Um, and it's unbelievable. It's a beautiful film, incredible cinematography, a really, really great script, incredible twist at the end and finale that was just, at the end of this movie, I was just, I was so shook. I just like watched the credit, credits roll, like a, my mouth agape, just like I couldn't believe what I had just seen. It was so shocking. Um, but it is a fantastic film. If you haven't seen it, check out Burning from 2018. I couldn't recommend it enough. What a recommendation. Whew. I'm tired after that one. Anthony's sweating. I'm sweating. You've got to watch this guy. <laughs> Anthony has a heart attack. Ever. Watch Burning. Relax, Anthony. We'll watch it. They'll, they're going to they're gonna put on their watch list, Anthony, okay? Relax, dude. I hope so. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I, I broke Anthony. <laughs> Relax, man. They're going to put it on their watch list. <laughs> <laughs> hitting the table the whole, over there the whole like, neighborhood knows you love burning now it's like a political speaker over there watch burning <laughs> <laughs> moving on to number 13 on our list from China coming out in 2000 we have Yi Yi directed by Edward Yang this was a movie we watched with Nicholas Martin Nick's, Nick recommended to us and when we watched it on our watch party Nick's been yeah. a patron for a long time long fucking time this movie centers on the struggles of an engineer and three generations of his middle class Taiwanese family in Taipei the film's title means one by one or one after another. When we're in, in vertical alignment, the two strokes resemble the character for two. This movie is really a patient, meditative look at life, at family, at generations, and, and sort of following different characters in this generation because you don't really get movies like this out of America or out of Hollywood. You know, this is it's kind of a long movie. I feel like it's close to three hours. It's it close, like. yeah, 240, something and like that. And a lot of the scenes are just sort of... On the surface, they might seem mundane or ordinary, but the film does a great job showing the complexities inside ordinary life and inside the modernity of life. Mm -hmm. A lot of European cinema does that as well, too. But specifically with this film in Yi Yi, it does a great job of showcasing that. Even something as simple as like a four-minute scene of this young boy outside his, his apartment door just doing some silly things with mm -hmm. a camera and taking photos of like his feet in the, in the <laughs> oh, ceiling yeah. and stuff like That's that. So one. There's great humor involved with it. Um, but just great emotional conflict and life conflicts that you don't see in many movies. Usually, you know, it's not like a high stakes scenario. It's not like the world's mm -hmm. going to end. Uh, it's not like there's a murderer running around, but it's just the complexities and problems that people deal with in their lives, whether it's adultery, finding out about that or, or something simple. But I, I think it's a really beautiful portrait on life. It's also cool to see a film like this that really showcases the cultural, the culture of the world. Uh, cultural differences from like a culture like ours where you see how people act, how people behave, how people speak, uh, the way totally people react and in, in, in do perform in different situations, how like things are celebrated differently um, and just how day to day life is different uh, in a different culture. And because there is no like real driving conflict or plot or like villain or protagonist, you get to, you get to really like observe a portrait of someone else's life from across the world, which is really cool for a film like this. Can't recommend it enough. Couldn't recommend it enough. Now, before we get into the rest of our list, we have some really, really incredible films on that list. Wait till you see. How about we head into our new mission? Gotcha. I was like, where's he going with this? <laughs> before we get into our incredible list, and we have some great movies. In the list. I, was like, <laughs> I was like, are you going to... That was a weird way to say I was say like, are you going to segue into the intermission, or are we going to keep talking about the movies? But before we continue, the best way to support Raiders of the Lost Podcast is to become a patron at patreon.com slash Raiders of the Lost Podcast. Why would I want to sign up for Patreon, Anthony? Yeah, why? Or a listener? Because you get access to ad-free versions of every single episode, not to mention cool-ass perks like access to our discord where we do watch parties with everybody like twice a month we just watched hot rod last week it was an absolute blast we just chat and hang out there's lots of great threads going on in discord lots of memes get spread but also just a great film community that has been built you get video messages you get merchandise free merch depending on what tier you're at you get a custom episode depending on what tier you're at as well as a private watch party it's a really great system to help support the show. We could not do Raiders of Lost podcast without Patreon. So thank you to everyone who is a Patreon patron or has been a patron in the past. Consider signing up today. You can also support the show by 
leaving those five-star ratings and reviews on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Why would you want to leave a five-star rating or review, Anthony? I don't know. Why? Because it supports our show so much by getting us seen by new listeners on these platforms. Don't you understand? <laughs> this is how it happens. You have to leave those five-star ratings or Anthony will starve. I don't want to starve. He won't be able to pay his rent. That's true. He won't be able to buy Trader <laughs> Joe's. Yeah. Juno's going to go hungry if you don't leave those five-star ratings and reviews, everybody. Do it for Juno. Do it for Judo. <laughs> for the cure. <laughs> <laughs> it's a Michael Scott reference. <laughs> also at 5,000 Apple ratings I will get a tattoo of whatever Anthony wants and then another great way to support the show is to just share us word of mouth it's the best way for a podcast to grow share us with your family members share us with your friends share us with your exes share us with people you don't like <laughs> send us to everyone send that X text sharing our link <laughs> <laughs> that 4 a.m. X drunken X text hey babe I mean hey hey Jessica remember when I sh- when we watched Godfather Check out this episode. Thought you might like it. Hope you've been well. Oh, happy birthday. <laughs> <laughs> how, how are things? I hope you're well. I miss you. <laughs> this episode, of course, is sponsored by our, our friends at MoviePosters.com, the number one place to get your posters online today. Be sure to use our promo code Raiders10 right now to get 10% off your order immediately. They have a huge selection of pretty much every movie and TV show imaginable in their poster library, as well as all sorts of sizes, framing, and even backlighting for your poster needs. We have a huge list of amazing Asian cinema, Asian films in this cinema episode. I am. It's a lot of words for movie. You know what I mean. <laughs> you can get all posters for those movies at movieposters.com. <laughs> and don't forget to use our promo code Raiders10 at movieposters.com to get 10% off your order right now. All right, I got through it. <laughs> good job, pal. Not a good job. I can't believe you gave me shit earlier about <laughs> speaking clearly and concisely. Well, because you're really like, it centers on. That's not the, all what I was doing. That's of not all I was doing. And not at all. Near. That's incorrect information. <laughs> I, it sounded exactly like you. Man. All right, let's just do the movie quote competition. <laughs> what do you so got? we can, so you can just, can you just stop talking? <laughs> just for like a minute, just stop. It's a podcast. Show your face. Show your face. Show your mouth. Show your face. Show your face. Show your face. Show your mouth. All right, guess this movie quote. Jessica, only child, from Illinois, Chicago, <laughs> classmate of Kin Jinmo, he's your cousin. Jessica, <laughs> only <laughs> child, from <laughs> Illinois, Chicago, <laughs> classmate of Kin Jinmo, he's your cousin. <laughs> Except in South Korean. Yeah. <laughs> Just Korean. Korean. <laughs> well, different. Yeah, I'm sure it's a different, different dialect. I'm sure, yeah. I'm sure it's different. Yes. <laughs> Korean. Parasite. <laughs> Correct. All right, here's my quote. There was one thing my murderer didn't understand. He didn't understand how much a father could love his child. So this is someone talking from the grave? From beyond the grave? Yes. In heaven? Wow, you are such a the, – the deduction process or within a, you. are they a ghost? I don't know, man. Say it again. I would happily say it again. There was one thing my murderer didn't understand. He didn't understand how much a father could love his child. Mm, mm. That sounds so familiar. You're on the right track, man. Am I? Yeah, you're Heaven? On. Yeah. Well, not quite heaven, but heaven-ish. Limbo? Maybe. Something like that. Oh, man. Oh, man. Oh, man. Oh, man. I don't know. The Lovely Bones mm. from Sir Ronan's line. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine if you said that to somebody. You have lovely bones. <laughs> what kind of compliment? Would, how, would you, well, how would you take that compliment? I mean, if they're older, then I think it's a compliment. If they're if, older? If it's like an older woman because bone density is difficult for women to maintain as they get older. So I think that's a compliment. Yeah, like but you from can't, a doctor. You can't tell what someone's bone density. I just meant like, <laughs> I'm not, I don't have someone under an MRI, an MRI Anthony. I'm just saying. Well, how else could you tell if the bones I, are lovely? I'm literally, exactly. <laughs> All so, I'm saying is I, what would it feel like if someone came up to you and said you have lovely bones? <laughs> That'd be weird. Thank you. That's all I asked. But also, well, not- actually, <laughs> actually, if it's an older woman, she'd probably find it a compliment. <laughs> Thank you. I've been taking vitamin D and calcium so often I'm deficient. <laughs> I was just saying, the, if someone was to compliment someone else on their bones, it would be because they'd have to be like looking at them in an MRI. So it must be a doctor situation. Well, you can see bone structure. 
That's why I'm just. It's a weird question. That's why I asked. It's, it is a weird question. You took it way too analytically. <laughs> yeah, I just answered it honestly. Well, let me think. <laughs> you didn't because I asked you. If someone asked you or said you have lovely bones, no, I was still honest. I just misinterpreted it big time. Yeah. I'm, big, honest, I'm, I'm not a dishonest person. Big time misinterpretation. Well, yeah, it's a weird compliment. That's why I asked. But also, it has doesn't have something to do with your facial structure at all. So then, like, it is a compliment. I mean, yeah, it's your skull. Yeah. Yeah. It's a compliment. <laughs> it's just a weird one. Also, your teeth are bones, and they're outside of your flesh. Isn't that interesting? Your teeth are the only bones that we can see. Well, you keep talking like an idiot. It isn't, won't be the, <laughs> isn't that wild? I'm going to pop that tibia out of your leg. Your, our teeth are the bones that we can see in our body. It's wild. <laughs> Makes you look at teeth differently. All right, what year did the lovely bones come out? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, <laughs> I think you're wrong. About what? I don't think teeth are bones. Oh, they're not? What are they? I think you just Googled it. <laughs> <laughs> I saw teeth on your iPhone. You just Googled Okay, motherfucker just like Googled our teeth phones. And then he looked at me as if he was like a college professor. <laughs> like a, a, a tenure professor at UCLA. <laughs> no, I, I don't think. I wouldn't, I wouldn't teach at I don't, UCLA. I don't think you're right. <laughs> After I Googled it. <laughs> <laughs> well, clearly, you know I'm not right. <laughs> Hearsay. Hearsay. The look on your face. Hearsay. You became a smug UCLA <laughs> tenure professor. I don't want to teach it. Why is UCLA? Because <laughs> they have a great science program. Do they? Yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't think, I don't think teeth are bones. <laughs> what are they? Here, let me Google it. Let me unlock my phone. Google our <laughs> teeth bones. <laughs> 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 You're so busted, man. I got you. You suspect. <laughs> <laughs> what are teeth? Did you Google our teeth bones? Enamel, dentin, and root cement. An odd question. Our teeth bones. Whilst your teeth and your bones may share similarities, most notably in both being made of strong materials, the sharing the same the color, they are not the same. Teeth are not made from bone. Bones are in a consistent cycle of being rebuilt and remade throughout your life. Yeah, they're not. They're similar. They're not, they're not the same, but they're similar. I mean, there's so a lot of collagen it's enamel. in there. It's enamel. A lot, there's a lot of collagen. Someone who's a dentist or a biologist. Yeah. Leave us a comment. Or has a better access to, who searched a better Google result. Let us know. <laughs> I can't get it. <laughs> you tried to sneak that past me. I saw the phone. I saw the teeth on your phone. <laughs> that shit was this funny. This motherfucker. That shit was funny. I don't think you're right. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I said. I said, I don't think teeth are bones. <laughs> After a Google search. Oh, man, that was good. Oh, you're ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what year did the lovely bones come out? Let's see. This is post Lord of the Rings. I want to say 2006. 2009. 2009. Which means you know my third question because you said post Lord of the Rings. <laughs> <laughs> what year did a bulletproof monk come out? 2001 2003 oh wow all right my original question was who directed the lovely bones but since you already know who played the killer in the lovely bones who says i know because you said it was post lord of the rings so <laughs> you knew peter jackson made it <laughs> who's peter jackson shut up <laughs> answer the question who's the who's the killer the in killer the lovely bones? in the lovely bones is stanley tucci yeah nice job thanks great great work whoa thanks you didn't Google that one. I've never even seen the movie. <laughs> never? That's how good I am. <laughs> it's good. It's good. Eh, it's, it's, it's good. You never even seen it. No, You're judging no, it. No, I'm based uh, off your your, oh, okay. your tone. Yeah. You're like, it's good. It, it's, good. it's good. It's good. The book's better. It's like, when you, what were you doing yesterday? You're like, it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> it's not good, bro. It's not. It's good. It's good. Moving on to movie pop quiz time. Who directed Rush Hour? Brett Ratner. Nice guy. Mm -hmm. Nice guy. Thanks. Well, he's not a nice guy, but nice guy for me. Good job on answering the question correctly. Thank you. Is that better clarification for yeah. you? Yeah. Thanks. Just didn't want you to get canceled <laughs> for calling Brett Ratner a nice guy. <laughs> I didn't call. I called you a nice guy. I know. I'm just saying. I was, well, I was it could have been misinterpreted. I wasn't even calling you a nice guy. I'm saying nice, like good job. Guy. I know. I'm just saving you. So you're not I'm a nice guy. No, but like to clarify, you're not a nice guy. <laughs> I just want to make sure that. You're just saying nice. I just want to make sure that comes you're across. 
<laughs> Crystal clear. You're not a zero nice, compliment. You involved. are not a nice guy. <laughs> <laughs> you are a guy. So nice job. Who is not nice? Nice you're, job. You're kind of guy. a dick. <laughs> so quit smiling at me with your enamel. My bones. <laughs> All right, we have a hater this week. <clears throat> Sirian Willems wrote in our A24 episode, Tangerine is not Sean Baker's first movie. It's his fifth unsubscribed. <laughs> we did not Google that before. <laughs> Another Anthony. You said it. I didn't say it. I've never even heard of I don't Sean even know Baker. who Sean Baker is. <laughs> I don't even know what A24 is, man. Get out of here. You get out of here. You All right. Out of here. What else we got? So we have a bunch of five-star ratings and reviews. I will read one of the reviews. Let's see. Who should we do today? I don't know. Who should we do? Should do an Italian name? <laughs> yeah, go for it. From Antonio Tranzi. Love it. Five stars. Such a perfect show hosted by two perfect guys. Aw. Wow. He thinks I'm nice. He never said nice. <laughs> All right, let's get that crystal clear. He Not once did Antonio say nice. Let me read it again. Such a perfect show hosted by two perfect. Yeah, it doesn't say nice. <laughs> yeah, we're calling someone perfect. Like, you definitely think they're nice. Debatable. <laughs> Debatable. Plus, Anyways, he doesn't know you like I know you. Thanks. By the way, thanks, Antonio. Antonio. He's kind of a dick. <laughs> he's kind of a dick, Antonio. So I, I would be careful about throwing that word perfect around. But thank you for the review. And thank you for listening. And thank you for the five stars. Antonio, you're the best. Thanks, Antonio. All right. What's your streaming recommendation? Netflix just added Apollo 13. Nice. So go check that movie out from Ron Howard, uh, starring Tom Hanks, Kevin Bacon, and a bunch of great actors, Ed Harris as well. It's a phenomenal, phenomenal movie. Deserved all of the Oscars it was nominated for and won. It was fantastic. Some of the most built-up suspense I've ever seen. Like yeah. when, when the ship's starting to break down and they're so close to the moon. Yeah. And they like got to figure out how to fix it. With what they have on board. Yeah. It's freaking awesome. The sound design. Even though you know yeah. what happens, yeah. if you don't know the history of it, it's so anxiety-inducing. And they filmed a lot of it in real zero-G. A lot of it was oh, filmed yeah. in zero-G. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. right. They were just going up and down. Yeah. Yeah, they actually went to the moon for it, too. And <laughs> didn't land, of course, because Apollo 13 didn't land. But they, they went around. They orbited the moon for this movie. Did they really? No. <laughs> <laughs> you sound like you're... It's, you don't even, not even sound sarcastic at all. <laughs> I was like, I don't know. Did they? <laughs> Got him. <laughs> no, man. They didn't go to the moon for Apollo 13, the movie. <laughs> <laughs> you're the one who sounds like a dick right now. <laughs> <laughs> I, listen, I never said I was a nice guy. <laughs> right? You're acting like I said I was like a good guy. That's true. You never said I'm that. I'm kind of a dick. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly, I just told you that they filmed them. They didn't go to the moon, you idiot! <laughs> Dude died in a hang gliding accident. What, what an idiot! <laughs> I fucking watched that yesterday. I, oh, yeah. I watched Wedding, Crash, Wedding Crashers last night. Oh my god, so funny. The first <laughs> act and then the, like the third act are amazing. Middle, bleh, but it's great. Once he shows, once Chaz <laughs> shows up, man. Oh man, right, should we get back into this? Oh, wait, my streaming recommendation. recommendation. My, yeah. Did we even? Did either of us say a word? Uh, the host is my streaming recommendation. Nice man, which Anthony brought up earlier. Now let's get back into our episode on the best Asian cinema of the 21st century. After that hysterical intermission, that's one of the funniest <laughs> we've ever done. <laughs> Next up at number 12 on our list, we have Infernal Affairs from China, which came out in 2002, co-written and directed by Andrew Lau and Alan Mack. The film follows an undercover Hong Kong police force officer who infiltrates a triad and another officer who is secretly a spy for the same triad. This is the original film that The Departed is based off of. This one is faster, uh, has some more energy. It's very like 2000s and 90s in terms of its aesthetic. Very cool, very sleek. Um, Why do they have like Furbies? Yes, yeah, everyone's <laughs> carrying Furbies. <laughs> yeah. The triad is selling Furbies. Pokemon cards. Yeah. <laughs> Gigapets. <laughs> They're all growing their own Gigapets. <laughs> oh man, that got me. <laughs> I'm crying. <laughs> Gigapets. <laughs> Furbies. <laughs> 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 they all have Furbies. <laughs> oh, fuck. 
<laughs> I just want to give everyone a picture in their minds of what the movie looks like. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Oh man, fuck. <laughs> Uh, it's really good. It, it is quite different from The Departed. It moves faster, but also it starts kind of later in the story than The Departed starts. Because The Departed will give you the backstories of the characters and Infernal Affairs. We're, we're already undercover, and it has been a while. So it does move along faster. It's got some great fights, some great shootouts. Overall, it's a fun action movie with a great script and great performances. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> and some Furbies. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I, I had like five tears coming up, man. Oh, man. <clears throat> oh, I'm on fire today. Let's move on to number 11 on our list. <laughs> <laughs> Have you been trying to hold it in? <laughs> He's still going. He's still going. Sorry. Just breathe, man. Just breathe. <laughs> I broke Anthony. <laughs> okay. All right, I'm back. <laughs> Just don't look at me. <laughs> look at me. <laughs> All right, All Park right, Chan Wook is back at number eleven on our list with "Decision to Leave," the most underrated film of the last five years in 2022. It came out from South Korea and didn't get a goddamn nomination. Zero from the Academy Awards, which was the biggest snub I think of the century. Not a single nom. The film follows married detective Jang Hae Joon, whose investigation of a man's death leads him to the man's widow, Chinese immigrant Song Seo Rae. Hey Jung's investigation of Seore as a suspect gradually leads him to develop feelings towards her. It's an incredible, dark, twisted romance and investigation. It's got great humor as well as incredible filmmaking. When it comes to using technology in film and adapting to whether it's smartphones, computers, whatever. Furbies. <laughs> Furbies. <laughs> Gigapets. <laughs> Game Boys, whatever it is. He's still going over there. Look at him. He's still crying. I don't think anyone's done it as well as Park Chan Wook in terms of embracing technology and using it to tell your story effectively for modern audiences. If your movie's set in a contemporary period or a present day period, you know, Fincher's great at filming technology in terms of like computers and stuff like that, but Park Chan Wook takes it to the next level where the phone and the communication via phones, which is so common in our lives, prevalent constantly every day for us, he makes it a part, a storytelling device in terms of inserting the audience inside technology or putting text really creatively on screen, looking inside the phones basically, and you're kind of this voyeur as a piece of technology for a lot of the communication, which is really interesting. Production design is stellar. The sets are incredible. Cinematography is off the goddamn charts, creative and phenomenal. I, I freaking love this movie. Freaking love it. Park Chan-wook is a legend, one of the best living filmmakers right now. And Decision to Leave is one of his best movies. It's it's top four in his filmography, maybe top three. It's yeah. also just a, a astounding feat of editing as well. Incredible yeah. editing. Yeah. But the camera work, is it was the best that year. Some of the best cinematography in the last several years. And it's so creative and inventive. He also portrays imagination really well, where he imagines like himself standing in like scenes and sequences, trying to put pieces of his investigation together. And overall, he depicts this unusual love story so well. There's really never been a like a love romance like this. It's just so odd and totally just weird. It's sort of a, a forbidden love, yeah, but it's inevitable. Yeah, in terms of, it has to happen at some point, but mm. it has. It can only exist. In fantasy. It can only exist, exist as a certain thing. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a great way to put it. It's great. Incredible film. All right. Next up at number 10, we have another South Korean film. I Saw the Devil, which came out in 2010 from Kim Ji-woon, who previously directed A Bearsweet Sweet Life, which was on this list. This film follows NIS agent Kim Soo-hyun, who embarks on a quest for revenge when his wife is brutally murdered by the psychopathic serial killer Jang kyung Chu. Now, this was the most original serial killer movie I had ever seen. He took the serial killer genre and was like, you've never seen it like this. I'm going to invert it so that the serial killer is the victim being chased. It's so brilliant because he's this guy, he works at NIS. He's great martial artist. He's, he's great with weapons and, and shooting. And so he's a dangerous person. And then when he finds out, when he discovers who the serial killer is, he doesn't turn him in. Even though he works for the law, he doesn't turn him in. Instead, he embarks on this on this odyssey of tormenting him, of beating him to a pulp to until the guy is on his very last breaths and then letting him survive, and making the killer be be the 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 pre, the prey of the predator. And it's brutal. 
It's in exciting, incredible chases, but it's also very dark and tragic too. Like very, very messed up and very difficult to watch it sometimes. The gore is extreme, um, and it's also very, very graphic, especially in the third act. But overall, it's so unpredictable. It has amazing twists and turns. It, uh, it, the the story unfolds in a way that keeps the audience on bated breath to see what happens next. It's a really remarkable action horror film. It's so, so good. It's a revenge movie where even the person getting vengeance is being punished at the same time mm -hmm. because he's doing terrible things. And even though you're doing terrible things to a horrible person, you still get punished for it. But it's an awesome conclusion to yeah. a great third act. Moving on to another, another animated film, Spirited Away from Hayao Miyazaki out of Japan. Probably his best film, his masterpiece. Tells the story of Chichiro Sen Okajino, a 10-year-old girl who, while moving to a new neighborhood, <clears throat> excuse me, all the laughing, I'm losing yeah. my voice, inadvertently enters the world of Kami. After her parents are turned into pigs by which Yubaba, Chichiro, takes a job working in Yubaba's bathhouse to find a way to free herself and her parents and return to the human world. This is just ultimate imagination dialed to a thousand with terrific storytelling, great themes, great elements. Family is such a strong element in this film. Family. And uh, <laughs> Miyazaki, it's a common theme in many of his movies, even his most recent and I think Chichiro is such a great lead character. She's so charismatic and likable, naive at times, and you can't help but just follow her footsteps and just watch her along this incredible path of creativity and imagination and color and wonder and, and creatures and monsters. And it's hysterical. It's scary at times and just absurdly good. It's just an all-time animated movie. It's really beautiful. I, I loved it. And I think it was the first Miyazaki film I ever saw. I think it was mine, too. Yeah. No, no, I saw Totoro. <laughs> first that was yeah first this, this was my first one my neighbor Totoro I um Princess Mononoke is my favorite still I love it all right next up at <clears throat> number <Cool>. eight <laughs> I can't give just like a relevant piece of uh information I'm just being a dick <laughs> <laughs> I told you man <laughs> I warned you <laughs> you did say you were a nice guy <laughs> you never said it all right next up at number eight we have Bong Joon Ho's Memories of Murder, which came out in 2003 from South Korea. This film is 20 years old. It's hard to believe. Holy crap. Yeah. In this film, detectives Park Duman and Seo Tae-yoon lead an investigation into a string of rapes and murders taking place in Haesong in the late 1980s. This is uh, like the masterpiece that he made before Parasite. It's that good. It's one of the greatest investigation films of all time. It's, like, right up there with, like, Seven or Zodiac or, like, Science of the Lambs. Like, it's, it's that good of an investigation film. It's very grim, but it's also very funny. The performances are phenomenal. Uh, the tone is just very specific, like all of Bong Joon-ho's films are. Um, ultimately, it's just a, a story that captivates you and compels you, and it's just so engrossing. And the more you learn about it, as the story's unfolding, as as more evidence is coming out, as uh, as they're piecing together more more pieces of information, uh, it's just an incredible piece of filmmaking and writing. Um, I, I think it, it absolutely floored me the first time I saw it, and I've seen it twice since. So I've seen it, I think, three times in total over the years. And it really is an astounding piece of, of directing from Bong Joon-ho. He's one of the greats of, of our time, and this is another example, a clear example, and he did it pretty early in his career. Uh, if you haven't seen Memories of, Mur of Murder, add it to your watch list. Absolutely. It's such a good ending, too. Yeah. Awesome ending. It's a haunting ending. I can't believe it's 2003, man. Yeah, 20 years ago. I saw Tarantino <clears throat> put it on his list of one of his favorite movies recently. Nice. One of his all-time favorite movies. Deserves, deserves that. Let's move on to number seven on our list. In 2016, from South Korea, we have The Wailing, another South Korean film that was on Amazon Prime for the yeah. longest time. It's the first time I saw Not it. Long fucking time. From, <laughs> directed by... <laughs> 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 Nae Hong Jin. How long have you been a cop? How long have you been undercover? Long, long, long time. Long fucking time. <laughs> Listen, I just want to get paid and get out of here. Hey, as we all want that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My computer's getting all bluey on me here, We've done the part references in back-to-back -back episodes. It's true. <laughs> Kind of relevant here because we did Infernal Affairs. So, yeah. the wailing after a mysterious Japanese man and his cane corso dog arrive in Gekseong, a small village in the mountains of South Korea, a mysterious infection breaks out and causes the villagers to become deranged and violently 
kill. Their families are very dark, but also funny at times horror movie, which is a common element to many South Korean horror films that has great elements of ghosts and horror and murder, as well as a solid story with great acting and a great ending that I don't want to spoil. Don't spoil it. I don't want to tell you what happens at the end of the film and the revelation of what's causing this outbreak of this madness in this small village. But it's so goddamn good. It's so creative, but also <laughs> it just makes sense to do this in, with the story. It's an excellent ending. It's one of my favorite endings in a horror movie ever. It's so dark and twisted, and it just like will keep you up at night. This movie. It's bone chilling. Yeah. It's a. It's one of those few horror movies where the ending does like. Uh, I've seen it a few times. It does just like stick with me, and it just chills my tingles my spine. It's just. It's one of those movies where it makes you question: What if that stuff is real? And there's there's great sequences with the shamanism, which is so cool and visually stunning and really interesting. Um, it's a long movie, but it's rewarding for the patient viewer. Not that it's boring, because it's very engaging from start to finish. Uh, really excellent filmmaking and, and wonderful performances from the lead cast. Uh, but all, overall, it's just such a gut wrenching horror film that is in its in a, in a league of its own with how it, like unique it is. All right. At number six on our list, we have Long Day's Journey Into Night, which came out in 2018 in China. Directed by Bi Gan, Liu Hongwu is haunted by the memory of a woman who disappeared long ago. The story of his involvement with that woman is then told in a chiefly nonlinear, out-of-order series of scenes that resist easy explanation. This is a very uh, challenging watch, but if you watch it all the way through and maybe give it a second watch, it's very, very... Uh, it opens up to you, and it makes itself very known. Uh, what I f- find so incredible about the film is its its incredible cinematography and performances. Most famously, it has a 56-minute uninterrupted one And This is a real one It's not blended with digital one shots. One shot, no cuts. No cuts. Now, how did you watch this last year? Awesome. And what they did, this is the greatest one take I've ever seen, ever. It's It's the best. Nothing can even, I don't think any, not even anything Alfonso Cuaron is on this level because it's so intricate, it's so massive in scale and scope. You have a lead character who starts in tunnels in a cave and he travels over a forest into a city. Literally over a forest. Yeah, over, over a forest. On wires. Yeah, on, on this huge like wire Sea. rigging. Yeah. And on top of the big moments, he's interacting with pool players who have to hit the shot. And there's a moment with a remote control car that's carrying an item keys keys all these little things the dude the fucking the firecrack i mean the uh the sparkler uh the fan there's so many little intricacies to this oneer the donkeys the donkeys then you have a crowd multiple times and you have a performance going on 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 a stage and then you have like cars driving i can only i don't know how long it took them to to prep this this shot it must have taken the months because there's so much to it, to it. There's so many details to it. And it's just what a sight to behold. And it like takes your breath away. Because uh, the first time I saw it, I didn't know how long the one take was. And I just kept watching. I didn't even know it had a one take in it. And I just kept watching and watching and watching. And I was like, oh, my God, this is not cutting. This is fucking insane. And I was just like, my heart was racing to see like, oh, don't mess that up. Don't mess this up. It was unbelievable. It's such an impressive feat of filmmaking. And on top of that, it's visually just one of the most beautiful films I've seen in recent memory. It's just so stunning. Uh, For fans of cinematography and production design and lighting, uh, this is like something you have to add to your watch list. Long Day's Journey Tonight. It's not based on the the play. Uh, It's its own thing. Uh, Check it out. Took two months to prep that shot. Wow, two months. And they did it. They did it seven times until they got it right. Mm -hmm. Wow. Just, just, just for one shot, unbelievable. Absolutely bonkers. Let's move on to our top five now. Wow. And we have a samurai film, 13 Assassins from 2010, out of Japan from Takashi Miike. It is a remake, loose remake of a film from 1963, and it's loosely based on real events. It's about a brave samurai who must assemble an elite team of 13 killers to assassinate the brother of a shogun who's a sadistic and well-protected young lord above the law, raping and killing innocents with impunity. 
the film culminates in a mind-blowing 45-minute battle sequence that rivals anything seen before in the genre. At the end of the day, this movie, it's basically... It doesn't reinvent the wheel with a samurai film, and we've seen similar films like this in the past. I mean, Seven Samurai is very similar. And it doesn't matter because it's, it just works so well. Sometimes just the old hits, the old formula, it just still works a lot of the time. And it's an awesome, awesome action film. It's like if you made Seven Samurai with today's production quality and yeah. technology. Not that old production quality is bad or anything, but it's awesome. Takashi Miike is an excellent director. He made a great horror film in 1999 called Audition. Almost made the list, but it was 1999. It almost did, but definitely watch that for sure. But 13 Assassins, if you like action movies, if you like samurai movies, put this on tonight. Put this on ASAP. It's a great starter samurai film because it's contemporary. Yeah. And it's an easier watch than the older films. But something that he was able to do was like the stunt work, uh, the special effects, the blood, the gore, um, and then the just the technology with filmmaking these days really advanced it so that he could do a lot of things that they weren't able to do back in the day. It's a really exciting film. It's visually so impressive, and the cast is phenomenal. Uh, I love the movie. It's one of my favorite action movies, and it's one of my favorite samurai movies. And it also has something in that, like something Seven Samurai doesn't quite have, and it's, it's got like a really specific, incredible villain. Like an antagonist that the audience, you just hate him. You hate him. You want him done. You want him dead. It's really fantastic. It's a sadistic movie at yeah. times, too. Yeah. It's pretty dark. Really an amazing film, 13 Assassins. All right, next up we have from 2000, coming out of South Korea, we have Park Chan-wook's Old Boy. The film follows the story of Oh dai Su, who is imprisoned in a cell that resembles a hotel room for 15 years without knowing the identity of of his captor or his captor's motives. When he finally is released, Dai Su finds himself still trapped in a web of conspiracy and violence as he seeks revenge against the enigmatic Li Wu Jin. His quest becomes tied in with romance when he falls in love with a young sushi chef, Mido. Mido. Old boy, we've talked about it so many times on this podcast, how much we adore it. We gotta do an episode on it. Yeah, we should do an episode Can on we it. Not? No, we haven't. No, we were thinking about doing one on the re-release. Yeah. Um, and it was great to see to finally see it in theaters. I've only ever watched it on a laptop or on a TV, and so to be able to sit in a theater, really big screen too, it was a great theater in AMC, and watch Old Boy was just a wonderful experience. It's an incredible film, one of the most unpredictable stories of all time. It has two incredible twists. One of them is so disturbing that it'll just leave you just like in awe and disturbed and irked. Incredible filmmaking, uh, incredible lead performance uh, from Choi Min Sik, uh, a lot of great humor, and just ultimately just kind of reinventing the thriller and mystery in a lot of ways, and and adding a huge jolt of energy into South Korean cinema. Absolutely, all timer, all timer. Top three now. These are all all timers now. Top three. At number three, we have In the Mood for Love from China. Came out in 2000 from Wong Kar Wai. It portrays a man and a woman whose spouses have an affair together who slowly develop feelings for each other. Now, they become neighbors, and they start to, you know, communicate and talk and become friendly. And their spouses are having an affair together somewhere else in China. I mean, in yeah. Japan, right? Yeah. In Japan. Out of town. And they're kind of on this never-ending honeymoon. And so this man and this woman, basically, they fill the shoes of the other person's spouse without intimacy. And it's basically another story, sort of like forbidden love, mm -hmm. where because of their beliefs, they don't want to, and because of how they feel about what their spouses have done to them, they don't want to stoop to their level in a lot of ways. That's how I interpret it. They don't want to succumb to what their spouses have done to them. They don't want to do that either. Even though the desire is there. Yeah, the desire is yeah. definitely there. But this movie's beautiful. It's got so much class, so much style, artistry. The filmmaking is excellent it's chaotic at times but many other times there are these wonderful hyper slow motion shots with the great music in the background like similar to if you watch parasite you know one mm -hmm. car why i was doing that for years and it's really really beautiful performances from tony lang and maggie chung tony lang you just saw him in he was in um what's it called he's in a in a big movie in america recently shang chi yeah he's in shang chi yeah. um they're both so terrific in this movie and charismatic and desirable. 
But I just love the class in this movie. I love the outfits. It's I love very the classy. wardrobe. It's very cool. It's it's also from like a different time and just I love to see how people lived in different eras, whether it's the fifties, the sixties, mm-hmm. the seventies. And I, I think it's just so romantic to go to a different time period when movies are shot so well and adapted for that time period so so well. And I, I love the suits and dresses in this movie. They're they're terrific. This movie really like makes me want to get noodles. Yeah. Because they, <laughs> they they get in that noodle line in the alley so often. <laughs> Every day. Yeah. And they eat. They go eating a lot. It's there's a lot of eating, like it just sitting in restaurants in yeah. this movie, with, which I really love. And it's like this movie's about like self restraint and control mm-hmm. as well. And you see them fighting that. The actor is just incredible. And you see the the performers like they're controlling that urge and fighting it back against it. And then, uh, is it Jade the Green Cups? Yeah, is that Jade? Yeah, just Jade oh, looks so good. Yeah. You should get some Jade stuff. The the tea cups and coffee cups, the Jade ones. Yeah, I love Jade. So amazing. All right, next up, we are in the final two films of the best Asian films of the century. And they come from, the next one comes from a big heavyweight of Asian cinema. Someone who's already been on this list, but because he's made so many great films. And that's Park Chan-wook. This time, with his 2016 film, The Handmaiden which is about a woman who is hired by a wealthy handmaiden to a Japanese heiress. Hired to be a wealthy handmaiden to a Japanese heiress, but secretly, she is involved in a plot to defraud her. This movie, I, this is a film that I, I wish I saw in theaters. It's one of those movies where it's like, I regret that my first watch of this was on Amazon Prime on, on our TV. Because it's that profound, it's that incredible, it's that brilliant uh, visually stunning, some of the best cinematography of all the films on this list. The production design, the costuming, uh, the makeup, uh, and this, it's this the story. It's so twisty and turvy, and and just you have no idea what's going to happen next. And it keeps shocking you, and surprising you, and disturbing you, and and engaging you. And it's filled with romance, and it's also it's filled with a lot of love and heart, which, I mean, it just works. And then you get violence, you get graphic, disturbing sequences. I just think this film is, without a doubt, one of the the shining uh, films in cinema of the last couple of decades. The the, the Handmaiden is uh, an absolute masterwork, and you have one of the greatest filmmakers of our time firing on all cylinders (laughs) and really just knocking it out of the park. And I don't want to say too much because this film is filled with twists. Uh, that start happening more earlier than halfway in the film. But all I can say is if you haven't seen The Handmaiden, watch it because you won't regret it and you won't forget it. Like all Park Chan Wook movies, at least once you'll scream out loud, What the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a couple of what the fuck moments yeah, in this one. Yeah, quite a couple. Great ending, like usual. All right, it's time for the final film on our list the wow. number one Asian film of the 21st century. I'm sure you've guessed what it is by now. From Bong Joon-ho in 2019 from South Korea, Parasite. Parasite is an acclaimed film this century, one of the best. Explores the lives of two families from opposite socioeconomic backgrounds, the Kims and the Parks. The Kims, a struggling family living in a basement apartment, get involved in the lives of the wealthy Park family through a cunning and elaborate plan. And the first time I saw this movie, I was just absolutely floored. Anthony again recommended it to me. He's like, you got to see this movie in theaters I right screamed now. it. <laughs> Parasite. It's incredible. And I, when I left the theater, I was just mind blown how good this movie was, how well written it was, how well made it was. So many secret little metaphors hidden in the background or just right in your face bluntly. It, it's just incredibly well thought out. Very clever filmmaking, very clever writing. The characters are excellent. The motivations are there as well as telling a story that reflects our lives and our time and, and being significant to culture to the day-to-day lives of everyday people, the hierarchies in our lives. And it's, it's just so powerful. This movie is just knocks the wind out of you. And there's so many things that, that Bong Joon-ho is, he's operating on so many levels here of storytelling, whether it's the things, little things like the table having specific numbers of chairs at it to telling you how many people are in the house. The lines and architecture, architecture and design of the house to divide people. It's just such a well-thought-out movie. Mm-hmm. It's just a brilliant filmmaking. It's honestly, we're, we're so lucky to have had this movie in our lives and to be able to see it because it's that special of a film. It's an all-timer. I think it's going to go down as like a top 20 movie of all time 
in the next like 10, 15 years. Yeah, I think it is. I think it's the top five of the century. And it's 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 actually probably top three of the century. It's just going to age so well. Yeah. It's so relevant. Everyone can relate to this movie. And it's absurdly good. Yeah. Well said, man. I, don't know I what couldn't agree with you. We did a great episode on it. We did a, one of my favorite episodes is our Parasite episode. We did like two epi- two hours on it. Yeah, that's one of my favorite that we did. There's so many things about it that no one you wouldn't notice until like you analyze it. Yeah. It's incredibly. I think it's kind of a film that you can over time people will be analyzing like they analyze The Shining. Yeah, probably. Because there's so many specific details to it. So much to it. And it's just, it deserved, it, I mean, it won so many Oscars, and it deserved more. It deserved asking, acting Oscars, because the cast is absolutely remarkable. Every performer, incredible performances. I could have seen, this could have gotten nominated for actor, lead actor, actress, supporting actress. It could have. Bong Joon-ho is a legend. Man, a legend. he's the guy. He's the, he's the juice. He made the best movie from Asian cinema in the 21st century. In our opinion. This is a good list. That wraps our list, yeah. Now, if you haven't seen any of these movies, add them to your watch list because we think you'll really enjoy them. Um, and it's we, we want to keep doing more episodes where we talk about um, international cinema because it's so important to us and we love it so much. And so making like a, a list like this is a fun way to tell you about a bunch of Asian films that maybe if you haven't seen them, now you can add them to your watch list. And we've done episodes on some of these, so check yeah. those episodes out for sure. For sure. And thank you so much for tuning into this episode of Raiders of the Lost Podcast. Be sure to become a patron at patreon.com slash Raiders of the Lost Podcast. Leave those five-star ratings and reviews, and don't forget to share it with your family and friends. Take care, everybody. See you next time. This episode was executive produced by our chosen one patrons, Cody Moen, Andrew Hagen, Benjamin Cook, Calvin Murphy Griggs, Darian, Tyler McFly, Mark Nikaj. Our Chosen One patrons are our biggest supporters. Thank you so much. Thank you for watching Raiders of the Lost Podcast. Be sure to hit that subscribe button. Hit the like button as well. Notifications for sure. Listen to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, everywhere you can listen to podcasts. And be sure to check out this other content we have on our YouTube channel.